Good morning. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word? I'll be reading from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and set out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching, he said this. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came, they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Jesus, would you give us insight into a passage that is on the surface very simple? And then as we spend more time with it, it is speaking on several different layers to our, our hearts and our minds and about your kingdom. I pray that you would, um, by your spirit, give us insight and interpretation into this passage and this parable. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is an interesting passage of Scripture, because on the surface it means one thing, and then at a deeper level it's going to speak to a different thing. So I'll just tell you, a lot of times we as pastors we like to uh, teach along, sometimes we don't like to let the cat out of the bag too soon, so we can really have that moment, but uh, in order to understand this passage, I've just got to lay it all out, and then we'll unpack it as we go. On one level, Jesus is talking about people, and he's actually talking about six kinds of people. He talks about four soils, but six kinds of people. The sower is sowing the Word of God, and it's not fair to say, well, Jesus is, is the sower, and he's a bad sower because he just throws it on bad ground. That's not the point. You can't go there. That wouldn't be appropriate. But the soil, the first three, the one in the path, the rocky and the thorn soil, are people who hear the word, but it doesn't stick. Those would be seen as people that reject the word of God in general. Now, I've heard this preached many different ways, four or five different ways. But it seems most probable, and scholars would agree, that the first three people are, are the first three soils are people that reject God's word. The fourth soil are those that are in the kingdom that are Christians that that know God and, and accept the word. Within that soil, there's three types: some bear 30, 60, and a hundred fold of fruit. That's one level. On the second level of the way Jesus is teaching this, it's a warning to those who are inside the kingdom. That your heart, that my heart, does not become like those who reject the word, hear it, and it goes in one ear and out the other. That you forget it by the time you get to the car, by the time you hit some traffic, you get home, by the time you get to the restaurant, you're frustrated because uh, there's people in front of you or they took your table or whatever. Or maybe you have one of those lovingly family discussions which turns sour on the way home. Or that you're excited about what you hear, but by Monday morning... It hasn't taken root, you haven't spent enough time with it, your heart's not ready, and it wears off. You forget what it was about. And Monday, you're back to your old ways. Or perhaps the warning that, uh, like the seed sown among the thorns, it grows up, but there are some, uh, actually Jesus talks about three things that we'll unpack. There's three things that just choke it out. So on one level, he's talking about people inside the kingdom and outside the kingdom. Here's something we cannot do. No one can walk out of here and be arrogant saying, well, because I'm a Christian, I'm better than everybody else. That is simply not true. 
we also can't walk out of here and go, well, I must be smarter than everybody else because I chose Jesus, because that's actually not true. Okay? So, now that we've got the ground rules, let's jump into the passage. There's something, by the way, I'll say this. Um, often we invite you to text in questions, and we, we, you may or may not know this, we follow up on Tuesdays, and we answer those questions. So if you have some questions today, let them fly. Uh, one thing I will do, I'll unpack how uh, good Jewish rabbis would understand how to read the Torah, and it's, it's a good understanding for how to read the Scriptures. In general, there's four, four levels, and I'll unpack that in the video, but it's very, very interesting because you can see it in this passage. Okay? That's all I'll say about it. I'll save it for the video. Maybe it'll take some of you there that um, normally don't go there. Mark does something very fun and very secretive that we miss when we read the passage. Whenever he writes here that the, uh, verse, in verse 1, the crowd that gathered around him was so large he got into a boat, sat in it out on the lake, and while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge... Now, Jesus is tell, telling a parable about what? Four types, of, four types of soil. Mark slides in a word here that gets translated as a different word, but it's just kind of fun. When it says the people are standing along the shore at the water's edge, the word there for water's edge is actually the word for soil. It gets translated differently, but it, it's, it's almost Mark stepping back after he's heard uh, Jesus' stories after he's watched all of Jesus' ministry, and he says, I'm going to slide this in here. The people are standing on the soil, and Jesus is telling a story about some soils, and the soil is people. Do you see what he's doing? I love when the scriptures, uh, when we can see that in the scriptures, it makes it so exciting. So the first soil is on the path. Some people hear the word of God, and it just bounces off. Oh, sheesh, I almost bounced off. <laughs> you would have loved that. That was YouTube worthy. Colleen's like, that's going straight to YouTube. He's down, he's out. Ah. <laughs> Order here. Come on, let's get it together. We should start over. <laughs> this first soil on the path. Why can't the seed get into the soil? Because it's hard. We talked about that two weeks ago. The progression of a hardening heart. For whatever reason, someone, uh, when you share the Word of God with them, they are hostile or they simply reject it. You cannot take that personally. They're not rejecting us as people. They're rejecting the Word of God. Now, we don't need to be offensive in our delivery. If they're going to be offended, let it be by the word of God and by the message. You're shaking your heads. You understand. I'll remind you of this. I've said this before. Who did Jesus talk to about hell very much in the New Testament? He talked to the religious leaders about hell a lot. But what did he talk to the sinners about? The kingdom. Do you see how we've gotten evangelism in our own way backwards from the way Jesus did it? Very interesting. This, this seed is sown on this path, and Jesus, when he unpacks his interpretation later, he said, Satan comes and sweeps it up because it won't go in. It's too hard. Now, one thing we like to do is go, why is it too hard? Well, maybe they're this. Well, maybe the scripture doesn't say. It says it, it's hard. It won't go in. That's the point. We have to be careful about speculating and become soil samplers of people in their hearts and go, oh, well, you know, this or that. Well, see, I met Jesus because my soil was very good. You can't go there. We cannot do that. But it's an understanding to go, some people will hear the word of God and will never, ever accept it. That should grieve us as it does the heart of Christ. That should grieve us. 
And if you're a believer, you shouldn't become paranoid and go, maybe that's me, maybe I'm fooling. No, no, no. Don't go there either. The devil would like to take you there. Don't let him. Because the seed cannot go into the soil, it's not going to have any roots. The word of God is in and out. The second soil is the soil among stones. I like what several commentators point out here. It said, uh, these are the impulsive people. Maybe they've gone to a crusade. Maybe they had an emotional moment. And they appear to be very on fire for God, but then it's, it's gone as quick as it comes. First to be excited, first to leave. You may or may not know this. Um, Denver, where I live, South Denver, is a desert. Everybody thinks of Colorado as very green trees. Well, on our side of the, the mountains, it's green because we pay for the water, okay? In fact, I just got my water bill, and we're a little bit over on the water budget. The other side of the state, Grand Junction, on, on the western slope, it's very, very green and lush. It's beautiful. Denver, it, when you see it from up above, it's kind of brown, except these green patches where people spend a lot of money paying for fertilizer and water, Okay. Well, because we have expansive soil in our area, when they build the houses, they put rocks around the houses for drainage, okay? And you have to aerate your lawns or your grass doesn't grow, and because it's mostly a clay makeup, um, the grass is very, very thinly rooted. When weeds and things, grass grow up around your house in the rocks, you can pull them up pretty easy. Now, me personally, I hate pulling weeds. I hate yard work. If you like that, take a vacation, come to Denver, do my yard work. It's fantastic. This is why you have children. Just kidding. Just kidding. Thank you, Debbie. You, you get this. Keisha was great at yard work, I'm sure. It's very easy to pull up. What's the point? The Word of God comes by, it doesn't stick because the roots are shallow. You can't lean into it and go, well, they had roots, so doesn't that make them a Christian? No, it really doesn't. It, it, it looked like it was going to stick, but it doesn't stick. Why? Jesus says two reasons. Because trouble or persecution. Well, aren't Christians persecuted? No. People begin to say, hey, um, how could you possibly believe that stuff? Yeah, really, I, really, I don't believe it at all. It's not going to stick. What does he mean by Trouble. Uh, Jesus uses a word, Mark's description of it can be suffering, distress, difficulty, tribulation. Remember, on one level, this is a reason the word of God doesn't stick to someone, but we as Christians must guard our hearts against things that when difficulties come, that we don't punt Jesus. And go, you're not getting it done in the way it needs to be, so I'm going to take over. Because I've got a plan, Jesus, and you, I don't know what you're doing. But I got a plan. I got to make some things happen. That's the way I do it at work. That's the way to do it at home. That's the way I'm going to do it with my spiritual walk. You, you can't do that. I think of Jesus, the night he was betrayed, and, and he, he's in the garden and he's wrestling. And he's wrestling. I'm so glad that God allowed the gospel writers to put that in the scriptures. It brings comfort that he wrestled because we wrestle. The word persecution is when people go out of their way to make trouble for you. I can remember when I was 16 years old, I became a Christian. I was a sophomore in high school. And I had friends who would love to try to make me frustrated or angry or make fun of me. They would come up with all kinds of things. Whether it was to shake the lunch table on the day I had a white shirt and they were serving red punch in the cafeteria to try to make the red punch go on the white shirt so I'd be frustrated, to do different things. And these were my friends. There are people who will go out of their way to make life difficult for you. Let me say this. Do not be one of those people who does that to others. Don't be someone who becomes a stumbling block for someone else. Now, I told you I hate yard work. Uh, do we have the pictures? 
I've got some real life pictures here from my garden. This is, this is part of my yard, and I want you to look at, um, hold on, can you know what i You see this little weed right here with the bloom? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's a weed. Now, this thing, I, I blame my neighbors because it likes to come through the, the, the fence. It's also in my yard. Here's the thing. It has blooms. It's an imposter. It looks like something that you planted and you love and whatever. But here's what happens. Okay, next slide. If I was smarter, I would have blown it up. Oh, there's the picture. It is blown up. Do you see that thing that wraps around the other plant? That is the blooming weed wrapping around my flower. Do you know what happens when it wraps around the flower? It squeezes and chokes like a boa constrictor. Is there another slide? Yeah, so this, this flower will, look, it will bloom for a bit, and then it will get choked out. This is what happens to some people. They, they get distracted. We'll unpack the distractions. Was there another one after? I don't think so. Oh, I know what it was. Something we talked about. Well, let's look at what Jesus says happens here. It's the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. The worries of this life. Becoming self-consumed with my important agenda. That I don't have time to think about spiritual things because I'm worried about now. And actually, you can understand that that's upside-down thinking because now, uh, according to James, now is our life is but a mist, and it's gone. If you think about a smoke from a fire, it's there, and then it drifts away, and it's gone. Your breath on a cold morning that you, you breathe out, and you see it, and then it disappears. From God's perspective, that's how long your life is. But someone could be upside down thinking, well, this life is really where it's at. He says, no, it's eternity. It's eternity. Some people, because of their self-consumption, will never turn to Christ. You don't need to take one of these as a Bible and beat them over the head. Simply bear witness. What have you seen and heard and know about Jesus? It is His It is his task to change hearts, not ours. Not ours. As a warning to believers, Matthew 6, 25 to 34, some of you may have memorized it from young. You can look it up during the week, but it says, don't worry. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. They don't worry. Why should you? Are you not much more valuable than them? Don't worry about tomorrow. It has enough trouble of its own. You would agree. Some of you go, yeah, I really don't worry. Some of you, that is your hobby. You worry for fun. The second thing that squeezes out the seed is the deceitfulness of wealth. I learned this one time. We were having a discussion in a 20-somethings ministry and, and as I'm up front teaching, we're having a discussion. I'm drawn on the whiteboard because I think better with a whiteboard and a dry erase marker in my hand. And someone said, well, you know, financial security is an oxymoron. And we all paused and said, let's think about that. You're exactly right. How secure are your finances? Can't they be gone like that? While we're here, the crock pot goes too long and your house disappears in flames. The tornado comes and it's gone. Stock market crashes. You've seen this before. And everything that we'd work so hard to store up and, and bank our future on is completely gone. Some people, because of the allure of wealth will never turn to Christ. Christian, beware. Beware of God's word becoming fruitless in your life because of our pursuit of wealth and things of this world. It's a lie to believe that money gives us more control. It's a deception. 
We think if we have more of it, we can control more of life. If we have more of it, we're more powerful. It will get us some things. The Beatles were right, it can't buy me love. Can't buy you control, can't buy you eternity. The third one is this. Third, third thing in the thorns that makes the word of God unfruitful. It's simply a desire for other things. So if, if worries of this life didn't get you in and pursuit of wealth did not get you, well then Mark's going to provide through the words of Jesus a, a sum up thing to be a catch-all. Here's what he means in his wording. It's a deep desire, a craving, or a longing for something that sidetracks your pursuit of Christ. Some people will be so focused on what they want, they will be consumed by it. They will not want anything to do with Christ. Believer, beware. It's often been said, well, we could look at your planner and see what's most important to you by where you spend your time. We could take your checkbook and see what's most important to you by the way we spend our money. Pause for a second. Worries of this life, deceitfulness of will, desire for other things. If something were to trip you up of those three, just think to yourself, you don't need to confess out loud. Would any of those realistically be true of you? Can you put a name on it? It is, and you fill in the blank. Because we have some gardening to do on our spiritual hearts this week because of this passage. We have to guard our hearts from them becoming infested with a a weed that looks very appealing. It even blooms. But it brings death and takes life wants to squeeze the Word of God into a powerless place in your life. Now, I'm not trying to to rhyme here, but here are some thoughts, some specifics I wrote down as questions. Is it your health? Is it your wealth? These desires for other things. Is it the perfect spouse? That's both to the married and to the non-married. The perfect job, the perfect house. What is something that competes with your allegiance for Christ? Well, these are the first three. These are where the, the seed is sown and, and the, the word of God doesn't uh, sink in. Then he speaks about a good soil. The good soil is a picture of a kingdom heart. How can you tell a kingdom life? Because it bears fruit. Now, 30, 60, 100. Some people are more gifted. Some some people have a, a larger sphere of influence. Some people have a smaller sphere of influence. You can't sit here and throw stones. Well, God likes them better because they get to be 100 and I'm 30 or whatever. Here's how we should look at it. I'm going to be faithful in the little things, and and as I'm faithful in the little things and find joy in serving Christ, I'm going to be happy with that. If he gives me more or or, or no more, I'm going to be faithful with what he's given me. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. At this point, some of us maybe go, well, I don't have any gifts. That's not true if you're a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit likes to give gifts. If you don't know what those are, I would love to have that conversation with you, truly. By the way, it is interesting. Um, There are some believers that take things more serious than others. Some of the spiritual disciplines, prayer, fasting, solitude, Scripture. Some take serving, outreach, evangelism, more important than others. They value it more. What, What about the reality and importance of kingdom secrets. Look at verse 9. Jesus says this, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, does he mean audible sound? No. (coughs) Excuse me. 
The idea here is hearing and understanding. You can hear sound, but are you listening? We can hear teaching, we can hear scripture, but are we learning? Are we understanding? If you want to know if you're a believer, can you understand the word? That's his point. For sake of time, don't turn here, but it's 1 Corinthians 1.18. Paul would say this, for the message of the cross, this is going to be a picture of it, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. They hear about the cross, they hear about Jesus, they hear that you devote a lot of your money and your time to this whole kingdom of heaven thing, and they think you're crazy because it's foolish. Why would you do that? God's not real. Paul would say, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God because you've seen it change lives. You've seen it change yours. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 24. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. People are looking for all kinds of things. But we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's foolishness to the Gentiles. But to whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. If people scoff at your Christianity, that's okay. They scoffed at Jesus when he walked the planet. They won't scoff when he comes back. And you don't need to tell them that. That's his business. We're called to love. You know, the interesting thing about the soil is people don't walk around with a sign that says, hey, I'm the soil, it will never soak in. I'm the one who's the worry wart and it it won't ever take root here. You don't know. So we are called to love. We're called to bear witness. There's not a conversation bubble cloud above them saying, hey, this is the one, this isn't the one. That's not how it is. Look at verse 10. This happens. When he was alone, being Jesus, when he was alone, the 12 and some others around him, asked him about the parables. He told them, the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything's said in parables. Why? Because those inside the kingdom, it's not a parable. They get it. When you read the word of God, ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight. Now, there are some with with, uh, stronger gifts in that area. Hang out with them. And then your gifts... Uh, that they don't have, they want to hang out with you so that we become the body of Christ, unified and growing into maturity. We need each other. Don't be a Christian that lives in isolation. Here's some questions that may occur. One, are the disciples special? No, because where do they get their insight? From God. Remember when Jesus had a discussion? Who do people say I am? Uh, Some say Elijah, Moses, John the Baptist. Who do you say? You're the Messiah. This was revealed to you by heaven. You didn't get that on your own. So when we understand teaching, understand insight to the scriptures, we can go, well, I just happen to be smarter than you. You should be more like me. Well, that's dumb because I can't. I'm not wired like that. Here's another question. Are there examples of of what Jesus is talking about, this insight in the scriptures. Here's one, just jot it down, Luke 10. Here's the scene. Jesus rolls into town. Mary and Martha's house. And Martha is very busy getting the pancakes ready because Jesus is here. And Mary does what? She sits at the feet of Jesus. It, it, it's the people that pursue Christ and want to know more because he stirred their hearts. That seed has has sunk in. And there's something there that's insatiable. They desire more. Their longing is not for other things. Yeah, I know you're sinful, so you're split. Sometimes I'm sinful, as Paul says in Romans 7, and sometimes I want to pursue God. But on the whole, you you have a spiritual hunger and desire. By the way, the more spiritual hunger and desire you have, the, the more it will crowd out desires for other things. It takes a larger part of your heart. And, and the more we neglect Christ and his word, the more those things want to crowd out the fruitfulness of Christ in our lives. It gets uncomfortable when we talk like that, I understand. 
Verse 12, Jesus says this. He's quoting from Isaiah 6. Those outside the kingdom, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Is Jesus being mean? No, he's just saying this is a reality. Some hear the message. They see miracles. The Pharisees saw miracles. And they still killed him. Accused him of being possessed. In the Old Testament, people would see the glory of God come down. They saw the fire shoot out from the Holy of Holies and take down Aaron's two sons. And some of them still did not respect God. So you can't say, oh, well, I, if I was there, I would live differently. Baloney. We have the scriptures, we have the Holy Spirit. If you're someone today sitting in here and you said, I've never committed my life to Christ. And there's a stirring there. That is the seed knocking. Jesus does not kick in doors. Revelation 3, he said, I stand at the door and knock. He said, everything that needs to be done to give us a relationship with the Father. If you're sitting there today and he's knocking, come now. You don't know this afternoon. You don't know about tomorrow. If you're a believer and perhaps uh, deceitfulness of wealth or worry or something is trying to crowd out Jesus and you just need someone to pray alongside you, please come when we ask you to come and, and let the prayer team pray with you. Not just today, but throughout the week. If you're someone who says, man, I've, I've been on the, the, the short end of the, the soil. I've not been disciplined. I've, I've been doing something else. Let someone pray for you. I'll close with this. From Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Hear this. Nothing, nothing means nothing. In all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes to him who we must give account. God knows. It's not a surprise to him. So if you don't know Christ, I'll invite you to come. If you do know Christ, you need prayer. It's, it's not something to be ashamed of. We all need help, right? So I'm invite the prayer team to come and be available. I invite you to come if you don't know Christ to let this take root today.